Welcome back. Today I'm finally getting a chance to record a reaction to Palantir's Q2 earnings report and conference call. I was away in Europe on vacation without Wi-Fi on a boat and unable to record, but I have a whole list of items I want to cover today that I believe will be very insightful. Talking about first my initial reaction to the quarter, the fallout from the earnings report, how management handled the quarter, communication risks, their growth, prior guidance, my expectations, what wasn't covered in the earnings call, what they'll be doing with their cash, any projections, what happened to Palantir's stance on being built for bad times, what about the sales team, the small portion of it that is actually doing the real work here, getting investors institutionally involved in the product, the letter that Alex Karp released, and some other news at the end as well. So I hope you'll stick with me here. I have a lot to talk about, a lot I want to dive into with more depth than some of the other videos that I've been watching as the reactions have come out. So first of all, my initial reaction, as you would have seen by following me on Twitter, I was hoping this quarter would be one of the more bullish ones. Palantir could flip to the upside. It looks like many others were hoping for that as well, but we knew with the implied move that Palantir could fall to $10 or rise to $13. It was just a matter of the results. And then the results of a small beat on revenue, a small beat on growth, but a large miss on the earnings per share. That is ultimately what we got. I am not going to read every single number. I want to save some of you time on that because you have obviously heard it by now, but the first thing that stuck out to me on this quarter, and undoubtedly one of the reasons the stock fell pretty hard, was because of the very troubling guidance between 474 and 475 million for Q3, implying no quarter over quarter growth practically for Palantir and their full year guidance of 1.9 billion, which was previously my bear case. And then we also had some great news that Palantir is actually working with OpenAI with their GPT-3 language product, as well as working with SpaceX and Starlink, which is a huge bombshell. This was a potential prediction, a potential rumor on SpaceX working with Palantir. They mentioned Starlink. They didn't talk about SpaceX, to my knowledge. But this is great, but it was not enough to hold up the stock, obviously. We're looking for the real numbers. We're looking to see where Palantir is headed. So the fallout was a drop to the $10 range, gave some more back to the $9 range rallied a little bit more, and as we sit here with the benefit of hindsight on how Palantir has reacted over the last few days, we see the stock marginally lower than its first reaction downwards. So what sort of reactions have we had from retail investors and from other investors alike? So Peru, who you may follow on Twitter, has 300,000 followers on Twitter, a pretty big name in the retail community, has sold all his Palantir shares. Of course, one person doesn't necessarily matter. One person can make their own opinions. He seems to be pretty right about the macro sense for the broader stock market, and I know is followed by many. So it's very interesting what he says about his response to selling. And he said, after reiterating minimum guidance of 30% year over year for 2022, revenue growth during the Q1 earnings release, which Palantir did, they slashed their revenue guidance to just 23% year over year. That is coming from the $1.9 billion annual target. And what he says, and this is the big issue here in terms of his analysis, is that this shows either management wasn't truthful last quarter or it doesn't have a firm grasp on its own business. Both aren't good, so I'm out. And on the other hand, we have Kevin O'Leary, who has been a Palantir investor before, said he is still interested in the name. He is interested in buying Palantir and will continue to do so, but is more interested in sitting on the sidelines for a little longer, a quarter or two, see how things play out with the midterm elections and how the markets react to that. So not necessarily focused in on this quarter and potentially more of a timing the market type of trade, but he did mention that. I wanted to bring that up. We had a mix of bullish and bearish analyst analysis leaning towards the bearish side, as you would have imagined from this report. And now I'm going to get into my analysis. So if we actually take a look back at the prior quarter here, one of the reasons I was more interested in seeing some significant upside for Palantir in what Q2 just got reported was for their outlook. And they had said, in addition to their expectations on this 30% 
revenue guidance or greater. But what I was talking about here was Palantir guiding for a base case of 470 million in revenue. Now it's great they delivered 473 million in revenue. Awesome to see that they're exceeding guidance, but, and this is a huge issue in terms of what I have been reading from the company, is it seems Palantir has gone from guidance that has been well exceeded in all of their earnings releases to now guidance that is barely exceeded to just in line, which is fine. But when management issues weak guidance, it's not necessarily an opportunity for Palantir to deliver on the upside because we know when Palantir does their quarterly earnings reports, they are well into the future quarter that they will be reporting on in three months. So they do have some visibility when it comes to what their numbers will likely be and the guidance that they have. So when Palantir said there's a base case and there's a wide range of potential upside to that guidance, I took that as Palantir is likely going to exceed this significantly. But what I was just saying is it seems Palantir has gone from guidance that is easily achieved and significantly outpaced to some that is potentially much more in line with what will happen. And when Palantir says they expect revenue non-growth in the third quarter, it does not inspire confidence from me that they're lowering this guidance on purpose to outperform it. I really do think they're going to have some issues with the quarter over quarter guidance that I net that I definitely did not see coming. And I just want to say a disclaimer in terms of how the management has handled Palantir's earnings and outlook and guidance and everything like that. And especially the conference calls, that's what I'll focus on right here is I don't care necessarily how they handle it. I know a lot of people get worked up on how Palantir chooses to portray itself on earnings calls, what they're actually saying, what the literal words are, if they're bragging about the product, it's saying how great it is when it might not be a great quarter or anything like that. I really don't necessarily care the angle that Palantir takes. I am much more focused on the numbers and the quantitative aspect of the business, what the business is able to generate. I don't necessarily care how management spins it. That is not what I am focused on as an investor. I am focused on what my outlook is based on the information I am able to take in throughout the quarter. That being said, I do think there is, as we've seen, and I do want to mention this, definitely a communications risk as we've seen quarter on quarter with what Palantir says versus what they deliver. And it's gotten to the point where it seems, especially this quarter, management didn't necessarily have a strong hold on where this quarter was going, back to that 30% guidance figure. So once again, I don't necessarily care who says what on the conference call, I'm much more focused on the numbers. That being said, it's been definitely hard to read when the company talks about what the future is going to be versus their expectations for the future and what they want to signal to the stock market and investors. So I definitely think there is risk there. And we talked about the potentially slowing growth. Alex Hart mentioned on the conference call his dedication to Palantir in terms of it speeding up its growth again and how they're going to leverage and ultimately, in his opinion, reach that 4.5 billion figure in the year 2025. But right now it does not appear there's a clear path to do so especially when you look on quarter over quarter growth that we've just seen and we're seeing for the next quarter. And I definitely don't think that's the right way to look at Palantir, but Palantir needs to be able to outline this sort of trajectory for investors to be able to understand exactly what they should be looking for. So enough rambling there. I want to talk about my expectations versus what Palantir actually delivered on all of these items right here. So my expectations, as I've mentioned before, way off on the revenue. I was expecting much more of a bull case from this strong quarter based on Palantir's talk around being built for hard times and working towards some of these opportunistic contracts when it comes to government work and maybe some commercial work as well. It seems none of this has come through. And management, Alex Karp talked about the frustrating nature of signing government contracts. Well, that's not really a sign of strength, a sign of confidence. You can't be frustrated with how the business actually works. There are certainly frustrating times, but it is not 
not a good sign when management is saying it's so frustrating how we can't grow as fast as we want to. Well, there's execution risk. We need to execute, all right? So that's just the reality of it. So, of course, a big miss on revenue versus my expectations. Luckily, it was a beat on the expectations that Palantir had set forth. And then on the gross profit, again, a miss of my expectations. But as you'll see, under on the R&D expectations that I had, under on the SGNA, under on the operating expenses, this is due to lower than my expectations for the stock-based compensation, which is good to see, and less of an operating loss than I was expecting. However, a significantly larger loss on the net income side of things due to the SPAC investments taking a big hit. Once again, Palantir's working to sell off these investments. Hopefully, we can get through with this. I think Palantir stock would actually be much, much higher if it weren't for all of these quarter-on-quarter -quarter hits of the SPAC investments that have just gone down the drain, very unfortunately, that have impacted Palantir quarter-on-quarter -quarter and hammered its earnings. Your stock could be maybe $15 or higher if it weren't for all of these investment losses. So I'll take that away and we'll scroll down and look at the trend here for what Palantir's actually put up for its real numbers. We'll see following this sort of trend, definitely not a breakout, potentially leveling off a little bit, but not severely. We'll see R&D staying pretty contained, SG&A rising a bit, but not exceeding anything that we've seen before. The operating expenses heading higher as the company continues to grow and the operating income looking pretty good. So all in all, I was definitely off on my expectations for what Palantir was going to deliver and I do take responsibility for that. I'm going to be updating my numbers shortly for my Palantir valuation model, which I will be revising downward. So making some negative revisions there based on what we have learned. And I'll just be honest, this might be a investment thesis breaker for some when it comes to Palantir, especially with that reduction of the 30% growth quarter on or year on year, I should say, because that is certainly something I was expecting. That's why I was expecting higher numbers when it comes to quarter on quarter growth. If Palantir isn't going to make 30% this year, how are they going to make 30% for the years going forward? There seems to be a lot more risk to the growth side of the business than I've seen before. Now, I just want to say the business is a great business. It's definitely one that I want to hold a piece of and own a part of as it continues to grow and as it continues to become one of the bigger companies in the world, really. However, when it comes down to expectations, it's really not a matter of how high of a quality the business is. It's a matter of the execution. And for Palantir, that execution is based on future growth. You just look at the surprise here for the EPS was a negative 133% surprise. Just awful. Now, surprise on the growth for the sales was pretty good as it has been. We know Palantir really does exceed their guidance, but you'll see this increase in surprise of sales has been dropping off steadily. And this is what I'm talking about is Palantir used to be able to say, we're going to do this, and then they would far exceed that number. Now they're giving guidance and just barely exceeding it. Who's to say they might not miss some of that? Now, I don't think they will because they like to be fairly conservative, but we're getting much more into that territory. I don't think it will last forever, but it's certainly a risk at this point. I wanted to bring that up. And then just on the Say Technologies questions, they actually only answered four of them. They took some that were more towards the top, which they don't always do. None of them are mine, but I do think these were fairly good questions. However, not really the best answers that we actually got, but they did leave out a lot of good questions that probably should have been addressed, and they actually removed them from the page here. So once again, not really giving the light of day to the retailers in terms of answering questions for an extended period of time, especially when their earnings call was only about 40 minutes and they definitely had much more time for questions as well as on the institutional side. I just wanted to mention that. I also wanted to say, given my feelings on this quarter and how it was a severe disappointment for me, I'm really surprised the stock has not dropped more. I'm not saying it will because, of course, there is likely a reason for it. Palantir sort of fell within the range expected in terms of the implied range from the earnings. But what I'm saying is I think Palantir may have faced a lot of that, as we've seen, 
the prior bottom, a lot of that downside baked in where even numbers like these and even an outlook like this with growth slowing, at least in the present term, can be absorbed into a stock price around the $10 range, which we're practically just at if you look back weeks, months prior. And I wanted to cover just this idea of Palantir continuing to stack cash. What are they going to do with it? There was this post on Reddit, the PLTR Reddit by Options Explained, talking about Palantir having $2.4 billion in cash, which is double digits worth of its share value, no debt, and its ability to pull credit and take loans. And take loans because debt isn't a bad thing as long as you use it to generate a higher return. So if Palantir is able to spend some of its cash, obviously, and or invest from loans to supercharge the business and really increase growth via acquisitions, via, as we see down here, opportunistic reasons, anything like that, expansions of any kind that would certainly be beneficial. Now, because Palantir has not done anything like that yet, it makes me think that they have not seen any of those potential opportunities and they are right now using using it to keep the balance sheet strong and use it for a potential emergency. But as we know, Palantir spends a lot on stock-based compensation, so their cash pile is not necessarily dwindling a lot, just the shares outstanding are rising a lot, which doesn't hurt the company, it hurts the shareholders. I think Palantir really got burned with its SPAC investment, so I don't think it's going to be doing any anything like that in terms of what it could be doing with its cash at the moment as this user mentions right here but i think they could maybe do an acquisition i floated a name that i thought was good a while back i don't remember it off the top of my head but i am not ultimately concerned what palantir is doing with its cash i really hope if they see an opportunity to increase the growth of the business increase the quality of its offerings that they would spring at that opportunity and definitely not sit on the sidelines but ultimately it's not my main concern at the moment and then alex carpet actually said at one moment that its sales team is at least in terms of the functional size around 40 personnel and that's really surprising to me because we've heard they're trying to get past that triple digit headcount for the sales team and i'm really surprised that their sales team is not potentially ramping well i know it takes time but it may not have the efficacy that palantir was initially hoping for and maybe its products are harder to sell than it initially had sensed and was looking for in terms of guidance when it was making this 30 percent plus guide but of course there is upside to beat that if the sales team is able to ramp i'm sure they can do well with that going forward it's just a near-term risk if it continues to be a struggle and the other thing i want to mention of course is the profitability alex carp gave a guide of profitability by the year 2025 this was one of the big red flags for me how could palantir guide for 2025 when in this video that i made alex carp was talking about two years out the stock base compensation is going to be lower on a basis that would allow them to achieve profitability, which if you count this year and if you count next year, it would be a 2023 to 2024 proposition. How can they extend that to 2025? Is something seriously wrong with the business? Well, my answer to that is I think he's sandbagging on this in terms of expecting them to achieve it sooner than they actually say that they will. You got to not necessarily believe that to be the case. I think they will beat this. However, in 2024, I am going to, as I said, have to push back my numbers in terms of when this occurs. But I do think they will be doing it before the year 2025, but it does not make me feel good that they are mentioning 2025 for profitability. That is definitely pushing out a catalyst, a much needed one for the stock. And then just on their slides that they released for the quarter, they always do a good job of presentation making it look nice. A lot of this that we've actually already seen from prior slideshows from Palantir, such as this TAM expansion, however, not really showing much in terms of numbers that we would like to see. We've seen prior slides like this, so they do like to reuse a lot and not a lot of slides that are incredibly insightful in terms of what will be powering the business. They talk about different avenues that they're pursuing and what they're doing to inspire confidence 
and in the investor community. And they talk about giving investors the product in terms of institutional investors to be able to allow them to use the product and potentially that could inform their investment ideas in terms of what they're actually thinking for Palantir. Now, I don't really have anything against this. I know some people think it's probably a waste of time. I think their time probably could be spent better in terms of working on the product rather than demoing it to institutional investors who have no need for it or a limited need for the product. But I definitely understand when you're talking about investing in a product, you want to be able to touch it <laughs> digitally or physically and be able to play with it to see how it actually works, what it does, and you definitely get more confident and more intimate with the product in the company once you do so, which could, once again, inform your investment decisions based on that experience. However, I don't really think it means that much. I think Palantir really needs to continue to involve its investor relations. If this is one way of doing that, I definitely support it. Don't think it's a big deal. Once again, something that's mentioned, I'm not really sure it's going to have a big effect. I think Palantir could do much better in terms of scripting a story around what it wants to share and tell for the quarter rather than just cherry picking a lot of the data and saying, we certainly believe our product is the best and we believe we will be growing into the future, which every company will say, and more so talking about what's so specifically unique about Palantir and how are they going to be executing going forward. That is really the word of the quarter execution how can palantir execute i really think that should be the focus i know that they can i definitely believe that they will it's just a matter of how well they do it so then just hitting a bit more on the growth deceleration as you've likely seen we saw that palantir's commercial has been decelerating a little bit more recently just from that q1 figure which was slightly elevated, which was great to see. And then if you actually go down to the figure here for the U.S. commercial, the reason it dropped a bit is we'll see the U.S. commercial has fallen off slightly. And then more so on the government side, we've seen the government continue to fall. And this has been really disappointing for me because we know that they've been struggling on the government side. And we know that Q3 is usually supposed to be one of the stronger quarters for the budget for the government in terms of when Palantir would actually receive contracts. And usually Q2 and Q3, in my opinion, are when Palantir should reap the rewards of that. And then we saw, of course, the weakness from Q4 to Q1. But we're seeing continued weakness into Q2. Now, of course, unprecedented times, lots of stuff going on globally and tremendous issues there. But for Palantir's growth to continue to decline sequentially in terms of quarter on quarter, a quarter on quarter decrease of the acceleration of growth is what I'm trying to say. Definitely not a good thing. So then we also had this letter from Alex Karp, letter to shareholders, where he got much more down to earth in terms of some of the numbers and talking about pretty much a business update in this regard, talking about the strength of Palantir's business in the US, how that has been growing as a proportion of total revenue and that's been increasing substantially, talking about the most significant growth yet to come. Now, this is where he kind of loses some people is, let's talk about where it's going to come from, how it's going to materialize, and all of that. Talking about how much the investments into Palantir's products are going to be realized. Well, that's great, and that's definitely what I believe and I think will happen. However, for, in order for this value to be captured. We need to hear more in that regard in order to understand that it will be the case. He's talking about some prior and former customers returning to Palantir's product after previously using other options and having those options fail and Palantir's Foundry product has brought them back. Now, this is great. This is huge in terms of Palantir's ability to provide a product that is meaningful for large enterprise clients. Now, this is not the be-all, end-all, a few clients returned. Palantir's product is the only viable one. Now, there's certainly different avenues that different enterprises and commercial businesses can actually use. But I did want to mention this because this is huge. We know Coca-Cola has returned as a customer when previously they didn't want to work with Palantir. Alex Harp has said how a lot of their clients don't like working with them. I don't know exactly why he's saying that. 
don't think that's something that he should say. However, it, it seems to be an honest reaction from him, and I hope they're able to work through that. There's a lot more to this letter, but that's where I'll leave it for now for my analysis, a super long video. And I just want to return here to give you some concluding thoughts. In terms of where I see Palantir going from here on a stock basis, it really seems like this quarter, uh, although we saw a drop off from above $11 per share to under 10 closer to $9 per share, I really do think Palantir is going to be following the macro market. I think this quarter is going to be digested. I think it already has been slightly digested. And it's really going to be a matter of how can Palantir do going forward. I think the price action shows you that reducing guidance for the full year and slowing growth with the stock only heading down 12 to 15 percent in a very treacherous macro environment potentially shows you that Palantir doesn't really necessarily have that much further to go south unless and until potentially the market goes south as well. So basically what I'm trying to say is I think Palantir just has to work some things out. I think the market is going to really put things on standby when it comes to Palantir. I wouldn't necessarily expect a breakout rally from here. We could see some weakness going forward, but honestly, I'm not sure what really to think at this point. I think what's much more important is if Palantir is able to get things moving in the right direction in the next couple quarters. So I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. I definitely did not enjoy this quarter as a shareholder in terms of someone excited about the future for Palantir, but I do not think this is the end for Palantir. I will not be selling my shares at this point. Let me know what more coverage you would like, and I will catch you in the next video. Until next time.